much of the Old Testament is, uh, is words of praise. We know, we know the book of Psalms, of course, is literally Israel's hymn book. Uh, but there are prayers and, and doxologies of praise scattered throughout. And one of those is contained in the words from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 28 through 34. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O loving and gracious God, as we this day approach your word, we pray for open hearts and minds. Help us receive, help us truly live your word and your will for us this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We Christians tend to hold a, a, a very soft spot for the churches, the church buildings actually, that played an important role in our faith journeys. I can picture the rooms where I had Sunday school classes as an elementary school kid, and I can walk into the sanctuaries of Phillips United Methodist Church and Lakewood United Methodist Church, both in suburban Denver, and, and show you exactly what's the same and what's changed since those spaces played such a large part in my own journey of faith, faith in Christ. I suspect many of you could do the same, whether it's related to our own church here at Tri Lakes or even the many places it called home, including a truck stop before, before coming to this wonderful building. Maybe you have those memories of your own home church somewhere far away. We, we can picture them, remember them with an almost photographic memory. Even as we, we understand somehow that, that the place, the physical setting of our faith story isn't the most important part of our faith story. But sometimes things happen that really drive that truth home. In February of this year, an Austin area Baptist pastor had the shock of his career when he headed into his church on a Tuesday morning. From a couple of blocks away, he, he noticed what seemed to be large clouds of dust arising from about where the church stood. He hurried on his way and as he turned the corner, he noticed the street nearly blocked by flatbed and dump trucks and heavy construction equipment. Then he said his heart practically flew out of his chest when he looked to where the church was supposed to be. Instead of the church, what he saw was a a pile of broken up wood and aluminum siding and electrical wiring and plumbing and furnishings and you name it, all at this point being scooped up by huge bulldozers and loaded onto dump trucks that lined up down the block to haul away the remnants of what had been his church to wherever they took such rubble. He got out of his car and, and began screaming at the workers to stop, but, but either no one heard him or no one cared to pay any attention to him. Finally, a man who turned out to be the foreman came over and told him they'd been hired by the city to do exactly what they had done. He even showed him the paperwork that authorized the whole thing. The pastor wasn't exactly stunned. He, he knew they were in a battle for the survival of their building with the city, but, but his understanding was that a, a scene like what was unfolding in front of him was many months away and many meetings away. Assuming they couldn't come to some sort of an arrangement with the city's building department. You see, that department had a, a couple of years ago condemned the building his church had met in since their founding. Back then in 1972, they'd hauled the structure from the army base where it had been sold for almost nothing as surplus to the lot that the pastor had bought with his own money to plant this congregation that had been his dream, his calling. The building was an old army barracks and it had served faithfully as that church's home since the day had been placed on the lot. 
he and his board knew it wasn't up to code and, and that the neighbors in this rapidly gentrifying neighborhood had complained, but they had plans to upgrade and update it a bit, paint it, make it, make it look a, a little bit better anyway. This church's membership was small, under 100 faithful folks and, and far from wealthy, but, but he'd been sure they could do something that would save their building. And, and he thought the city was on board too, but apparently not. There being waved in front of his face by the foreman was the order from the city, the demolition permit, and beyond those dreaded papers, just a pile of rubble dwindling down as it was hauled away. Lawyers he begged to get involved reviewed everything and sadly informed him and the church board that the city had done everything by the book. But it was obvious they really just wanted this simple, plain church building out of the way of the future glories they envisioned for this up-and-coming neighborhood. The final blow and the true revelation of the city's motives came in the mail later that week. A property tax bill for a church that was like all other church properties supposed to be exempt from paying property taxes. The city, claim, the city was claiming that it, it couldn't be a church property without a building. And it was backdating the tax bill three years to when they began condemnation proceedings against the building. The total was over $30,000, far more than the church had in its accounts. All seemed hopeless. For the next several Sundays, faithful church members gathered at the site, kept from accessing the actual lot now by fences that the city put up, but, but holding a combination worship service and protest on the sidewalk. A TV crew interviewing one faithful member who had been there the day the barracks building was delivered to the empty lot and their hopes for a faithful future were at their peak told, told the reporter she couldn't imagine worshiping anywhere else. This was her church and and there was no place else that she felt she could truly worship God. Eventually, the congregation did merge with another nearby Baptist church, and, and most of the members gradually made the switch. The combined churches were now healthier together and, and were even doing outreach and mission that individually they hadn't done for years. But for the folks whose church building now sat in pieces at a dump somewhere in Texas, the pain of losing their church home was very real. Please stand now and body your spirit for the reading of this morning's gospel from John chapter 4, verses 21 through 26. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he, is, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. The gospel of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You might recognize these verses as from John as, as coming from the opening of that famous encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. We know that story. It's preached on a lot in church, but... But the focus is almost always on what happens at the end of the story. As, as the woman comes to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and she becomes his first actual evangelist, bringing her entire town to hear him preach. But the end of the story begins with the words we heard this morning, a, a debate, really an old-fashioned argument over where was the appropriate place to worship God. And actually the whole encounter should really never have happened. If Jesus had only minded his cultural P's and Q's and avoided Samaritan territory like the plague, just like most other good Jews of his day did. But Jesus, of course, was never one to put customs and tradition over his love for the lost, and so this story unfolds. Samaritans back then were hated by the Jews, although they were, were kind of cousins. They traced their common ancestry back to Abraham as well, just like the Jews. 
Their scripture contained the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, although edited and changed a bit. And they rejected the rest of what we call the Old Testament that the Jews then and now considered to be scripture, God's word. But the animosity goes deeper than scriptural preferences. The Jews felt with maybe some historical backing that the Samaritans had been the group of Hebrew people who had collaborated with the Assyrian and Babylonian empires and, and had in that way avoided the decimation and the exile that the other people, the other tribes had faced. And when they remained in the promised land, they began to intermarry with Gentiles, further fueling the flames of hatred and division. Jesus and this Samaritan woman begin their discussion on one of the most puzzling aspects of the feud between Jews and Samaritans, a, a squabble going on for nearly six centuries by the time this meeting occurred. Where is the appropriate place to worship God? It's a more important point in their setting than we can understand from ours, even with our own love of our own holy places. The Jews, following the mandates of books in the Bible rejected by the Samaritans, believed that the only appropriate place to worship God was at the temple in Jerusalem. Sure, you could pray at home, you could study scripture and hear teaching at the synagogue in your local hometown, but, but true worship, the full ritual and liturgy and offering of sacrifices only took place in Jerusalem, only at the temple. Anything else was inconceivable, it was literally blasphemy in their eyes. But the Samaritans, free from the strictures that guided Jewish belief, held that their much more modest temple nearby at Mount Gerizim was the actual appropriate place to worship God. It was there that the Hebrew people first worshiped as they entered the promised land. And it fit their own conception that, that they were the true remnant of God's chosen people, not the Jews. So we enter into this scene as the argument unfolds between Jesus and this woman. She actually only brought up the point in the first place to distract Jesus from his focus on her domestic situation and the shame that brought her to this well at noon, an hour when no other woman would be there to ridicule her or deepen her misery. But Jesus, as we see throughout the Gospels, doesn't allow distractions to move him away from his intended point. Something is missing in this woman's life, and, and she needs to understand that and then realize the answer is Jesus himself, now standing in front of her, asking her for a drink of water. But if appropriate worship is the distraction that she attempts to use to change the subject, that's a topic that Jesus knows he can use to drive his point home. Jesus points out in that abrupt rabbinic teaching style that can sound a, a little bit harsh to our modern Western ears, that not only is her Samaritan belief system in error, but that the answer to her problem, her salvation, is in fact coming from the Jews. In verses 23 and 24, he goes on to let her in on a secret that even the disciples don't fully comprehend just yet. God is doing a new thing. And soon there won't be just one right place to worship God anyway. Because God will be restoring the relationship between himself and humanity. God will be entering into the hearts of those who love him. And true worship will be worship that recognizes that flows from that truth. The Samaritan woman seems to know her scripture pretty well, even if it's limited to those first five books. I know the Messiah is coming, she says in verse 25. When he comes, she's sure, then everything will be made clear. Then everything will be made right. And here Jesus does something else he has yet to do for even his inner circle of 12 disciples. He confesses to her that he is that Messiah. The promised one of God come to reveal, come to save, now standing in front of her. God is spirit, Jesus reminds her and us in this encounter. God is not like us, visible, limited, easy to peg down and box up. To know God, to, to truly worship God, God must choose to reveal himself to us. And he does that most completely in Jesus, of course. God the Son putting on human flesh, walking our walk, sharing our joys and our struggles, showing us love. 
God among us. And because Jesus, who is the truth, came and showed us God, now we can fully worship in spirit and in truth no matter where we find ourselves. And Jesus is still calling us today to worship. You know, I often ask Bible studies or other classes I'm teaching what they think the most important role of the church is. The answers are what you'd expect. Some say mission. In other words, loving our neighbors like Jesus told us to. Others say evangelism, being obedient to Jesus' great commission to bring the good news to all of the world. Some say fellowship. Some say discipleship or or learning more about our faith, about Jesus and God and God's word. And, And those are all important answers. And in case you didn't notice, they're also all words we're either looked at or will be looking at in this sermon series. Many folks are taken aback when I tell them that the most important function of the church is worship. All too often, folks see worship as just kind of a given. I guess it's, it's just there. It's part of the program. We want it to be good, good music, nice prayers, comfortable chairs, acceptable sermons that don't run too long. But in fact, worship is the very heart of what it means to be a church. We serve in mission as an act of worship. We evangelize to bring more of God's beloved children into the true worship of God through Jesus Christ. We learn more about the Bible and our faith so so we can worship better, more completely with our head as well as our heart. Worship is the core function of the church. And worship is God's eternal design for all of those who call him Lord. And because... God understands just how much we need worship. God literally demands worship from us throughout all of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Worship is our respite from a world that pulls us in different directions. Worship is our chance to reconnect with our sisters and brothers in the faith and feel through them the love of God offered to us in Christ. Worship is our chance to come together at the table and remember and be strengthened as we receive communion. But above all, worship is our regular reminder that God is God and we are not. And boy, do we need that reminder. Now more than ever in our world, which which seems convinced that we human beings are the end all and be all of everything. Christian author George Vandeman writes about a friend of his who decided to climb Mount Blanc in the Alps. To make that difficult climb, it required hiring two guides, one to lead in front of him, one to follow behind to make sure their ropes were always securely fastened as they progressed up the mountain. Not only is the climb up incredibly steep on rock faces to that summit altitude at 15,780 feet, but but the wind is a constant threat. In fact, the last one third of the climb is is done crouching down and often on your knees to keep from being blown off the side of the mountain as those gale force winds hit. As they approached the summit, the lead guide, as was the tradition, turned to him and directed him to take the last few steps by himself first and, and take in that amazing view, 360 degrees of God's amazing creation spread out before them. Without thinking, Vandeman's Fred stood up to take those last few steps. Fortunately, the guide had quick reactions and immediately pulled him down. His words to this climbing friend are words that we should hear today as well. On your knees, my friend, on your knees. You're never safe. You can never see the view unless you're on your knees. As followers of Christ, our perspective, our security truly comes only when we remember to get on our knees before the God of the universe, the creator of us all, in thanksgiving, in praise, and true worship. Amen and I'll see you in church. Let's pray. Oh, loving God, this day we come to worship. Forgive our distractions, God, and quiet our minds. Help us truly understand that this day we come to worship in spirit and truth, to give thanks for the gift that is our Savior, to give thanks for the beauty of your creation which surrounds us and your abundant provision which provides for our needs. This day, God, we come to worship 
Bless us this day as we too are on our knees in Christ's name. Amen.